and we slept a few feet away from dead bodies. As dawn came we were already wide awake and brimming with energy. I had made it clear the night before that we were going to attack the powder gangers in Prim and kill them all. Effectively we would win them over like Bonnie and Good Springs. The only issue is that we had 12 NCR prisoners to guard. Exactly how we would keep them from running away and staying at full operational efficiency I had yet to figure out. What if we leave a few of your Roberts to guard them? Roberts are extra trigger happy so it should keep them in check. I shook my head and stood to my feet. Even the troopers don't know the full strength of the powder gangers in this town. We will need to have all assets under our control for this operation to be successful. Hypothetically at least. What do you mean hypothetically? I fiddled with my pistol then turned to Vulp. He was a semi-skilled strategist and always tried understanding the actions or tactics dictated by others. You see if we have all of our assets at the ready, instead of being occupied, we have the full possibility of liquidating our tactics and reassessing the situation as the tides of battle dictate. Vulp nods and sets down a bottle of water he was sipping at. I got an idea that most likely would work, but only if it was executed correctly. We can however try to get our enemies strengths and weaknesses. One thing we know about powder gangers is that they've been restricted to small arms and industrial grade explosives. I might have a strategy able to nullify both of their weapon groups, but we better fucking learn to huddle like penguins. What are penguins? Are you sure this will work? Your robots are pretty fucking stupid. I turned my head to Conrad and just smiled. We had lined up the egos in a tight wedge formation. One leader and three on either side of him. Me, Jack Hall, Conrad, and the farmers were inside this open wedge. The plan was to leave two of the recruits with the prisoners. Vulp would ambush the powder gangers from south with Richardson while we hit them from the west. I could easily repair any minor damage to the egos but I couldn't replace human lives. As we began moving, after we had already crossed the bridge, we heard the confused talking of the powder gangers. Initiate Propaganda Protocol 34. The egos begin broadcasting a recorded file off in unison. We are the Enclave, stay in your homes. The threat will be neutralized momentarily. God bless America. I turned to everyone with me and said on the third time the audio loops, rise up and start shooting these fuckers. As the second loop came to an end the egos started shooting at the powder gangers. They in return began shooting back, 9mm ricocheted off on the hull of the leftmost robot and one of the farmers almost pissed himself. Calm it down, just wait. The third loop came near its end, and in the final syllable we all raised up and unleashed hell on the nearest of the powder gangers. One of the farmers blew one guy's head off. A few seconds later and they were all dead. Jack all darted out from behind the protectrons and over towards a building's corner. I only realized after he took the kill shot that there was a sniper on top of the hotel directly ahead of us. Good shot kid but next time call the shit out so one of us don't get shot. Jack Hall just nodded up to me and got back with our wedge formation. I scanned around the streets, surveying the amount of dead bodies. I turn to my left and see Richardson in a dead sprint towards us, behind him is Vulp and the recruits. I may have forgot to mention but it had been 4 months since I adopted Richardson. In that time he's grown exceptionally larger. Before he was about my height. Now he stood 2 or 3 feet over me. Did you encounter any powder gangers from the south entrance? Vulp didn't reply to me, but turned his gaze to Richardson who was picking cloth out of his teeth. I nodded and patted Richardson's belly. Good boy, let's go get dessert. Peter, what's that supposed to mean? I turned to Conrad then pointed to the hotel. There was a sniper on top of that building's roof. Which means there are men inside making sure the sniper doesn't get flanked. Let's go and pay them a visit. Just before I could start giving orders. Richardson snapped his neck to the left and began prowling towards a car hood propped up against a brick wall. Before anyone could say a word I shushed them and followed Richardson closely. Richardson was easily the most intelligent wild death claw I had ever seen, god knows what he'd be capable of with a neural unit. Once we got close enough to the hood Richardson slipped his claws over the top of it and pulled it just enough towards him so that he could peer inside. He was met with a high pitched barking. What the fuck dot png. I tap Richardson and point for him to go away. I put my hand on the hood and pulled it away from the building. Sitting there staring at me was a little boy who wasn't even 10 and a young dog he was gripping tightly. Are you alright son? I don't know why I asked, he just kept staring at me. I turned to Conrad. Find me some sweets or a soda or something, it's a kid. 
Conrad started going from person to person seeing if they had anything I could use to get the kid to come out. Eventually Jack Hall gives up a Nuka Cola, more correctly he got a gut punch and Conrad took the cola. He handed the soda to me and I looked back at the kid. Are you thirsty? He nodded at me weakly. I showed him the cola and he lit up like a Christmas tree. Come on out so we can talk and it's all yours. For a few seconds the kid didn't move but he slowly began crawling out from behind the hood. Once he was out from behind the hood he put his dog down, who was had been leashed to his wrist with a thin rope. I squatted down, popped the cap off the Nuka Cola, and handed it to the boy. So what's your name buddy? He started gulping down the pop but stopped and wiped his mouth off the sugary drink. Bradley, I smiled at him and looked at him a tad confused. What are you doing out here while all of these criminals are around Bradley? He stopped drinking again to answer me. I had to go get sticks. I smiled and chuckled. Is that the name of this little guy? He smiled back at me and did a quick nod. You're a brave little boy to go get your puppy, very responsible too. Where is everyone? He gulped down the last of the pot then set the bottle down on the concrete. He turned and pointed at the building across the street. The Vicky and Vance Casino huh? Are your parents in there? He nodded to me and wiped the sweat off his brow. Well how about we go and see them? Would you like to do that? Conrad take Bradley's puppy, it'll carry him. Let's go see how the people of Prim are faring under NCR protection. When we walked through the doors of the casino we were met with a blinding light and a dozen voices telling us all to put our hands up at once. We of course did not comply, we only waited for the people to notice Bradley. We heard the dropping of a rifle and watched as a man ran forward. I set the boy down and he ran into the man's arms. A few seconds later a woman came and joined in the love fest. For a whole minute they were just loving and telling the boy how much they worried. Eventually they turned off the floodlights. The father looked up to thank us but only gasped at the realization that we were the enclave they had heard so much about. Everyone else in casino realized it too. At this time Conrad put the dog down and it ran over to the family. The father stood up and approached me. He shook my hand and was about to start talking when one of the people behind him said loudly. It's the enclave. The father ignored the person and thanked me for saving his son. Everyone, listen to me because he'll only be saying it once. We are the Enclave. Any rumors you heard about us being heartless murderers is a fiction beyond comprehension. But the time for talking is not upon us. We know some of the powder gangers are in the hotel. Stay back and let us do our job, we'll deal with them quickly. When I finished speaking to the citizens it was decided that a frontal attack on the hotel was a madman's suicide attempt. The remaining powder gangers knew we were here and may have even opened their windows to see us. Whether they were smart enough to cover all the entrances had yet to be seen. Vulp do you think you can do it? There's too many variables for me to give you a definite answer. Conrad and I give Vulp the cut the shit look. If I can't do it I'll fucking start shooting people. I nod then look towards the front doors as Vulp goes into a jog up the roller coaster ramp. So what is the whole plan? I kinda understand that you'll send Vulp through an entrance they aren't protecting but why not just have all of us go through the door up top? Men in the Legion have been taught since they were old enough to understand words that they were never going to be at any real advantage. Vulp understands tactics and strategy at a beginner's level, but he still understands. He's also very bloodthirsty. Hell clear out the upstairs of the building silently and efficiently then cut a path to the front doors for us. Unlike either of us he is silent and meticulous. Either of us could probably kill a dozen powder gangers. But would we do it with enough silence to keep a cat sleeping, and check enough corners to keep a fallen house standing? I think not. In the few months I knew Conrad I found out how dangerous he was, more so than anyone I had ever met. Not because of how well he could fight, which I hadn't yet tried finding out. But because how much he soaked up information. When I met Conrad he was an ignorant vault dweller who didn't know east from west. Now? A budding tactician and squad leader. His reflexes in firefights had gone from a adrenaline pumped frenzy to a slow breathing and calculating machine. Conrad had a very nice career ahead of him if I had anything say about it. While we were waiting for Vulp to clear the door for entry we had been talking about the size of the boss. I was cut off mid-sentence when gunshots rang out from inside the building. I couldn't tell what floor what they were coming from, bad perception roll. But I soon found out that his was extremely close. We swung the doors open to find three men with their backs to us. They were obviously shooting at someone behind the counter 10 meters in front of them. 
Conrad didn't wait to start shooting or even try to knock them out. I shot one in the back of the head and he killed the other two with his RCW. We waited a second then called out to Vulp. He jumped up and over the counter in an instant. Everyone upstairs is dead but Thief got a shitload of guys in the cafeteria. What's the plan? I looked to Conrad and nodded for him to say something. Strike them while they're trying to fortify the room. They know we're coming but if we're fast enough we can kill them all in one fell swoop. Pretty much this meant let's fucking kill them all. We headed through the hotel in a sprint until Conrad ran past a doorway and people started unloading at him. Talk about a late reaction. So what's the plan now? Just clear the room head first. No. Do you have a grenade? Conrad gives me a weird look. I wasn't even serious throw it to me. Conrad tosses me the grenade and I roll for an accuracy and speed check. Roll good on the speed, mediocre on the accuracy. I run past the doorway and toss the grenade in. After the explosion the first one in was Richardson, more pissed off than a well what's more pissed off than a death claw. Next to follow was Conrad and the recruits. One of the recruits caught a shotgun blast to the chest. He didn't make it but he put a spear through the guy's neck before dropping dead right beside him. The room wasn't as filled to the brim as we had once believed but they were ready for us by the time we had gotten to the room. It lasted only a few seconds but by the time it was cleared out 6 powder cucks were dead to our 1. What really was strange was that we found a hostage in the kitchen. While the men were looting the bodies and burning our dead, I went over to talk to him. I didn't know powder gangs took prisoners. I guess I was just luckier than hell. Mind untying me? I took a few seconds to try and figure some shit out. What's your name? It's Beagle, Deputy Beagle. I scoffed at him before replying. How exactly did you get caught? Where's the sheriff? Well they ran up on me when I wasn't paying attention. As for the sheriff they broke in his house and killed him and my sister. I paused to take Beagle's gun, which hadn't been taken away. So you're telling me that they killed your sister and your sister's husband, who is also the sheriff. And you didn't force them to kill you? He looked at me confused for a second. I wonder if your gun is still loaded. So why'd you shoot him? He was either a traitor or a coward, both are very dangerous. What did the powder gangers have? I pilfered through what the powder gangers had, absolute shit. We took their guns and threw them into a duffel bag. Once we gathered everything worth a damn we piled all of the bodies in the middle of the room and set them ablaze. When we left we saw that the citizens of Prim were already peering out of the casino. It's done. You can all come out now. People burst out of the casino and began crowding us, asking us questions, all the while Richardson was trying to pull a leather backpack out from under a destroyed car. The same question kept the being repeated until eventually I decided to speak. The NCR no longer occupies the camp outside of the town. We commenced an attack on it late in the afternoon yesterday. Also, we have made prisoners out of the surviving NCR soldiers, they will be returned to the Mojave outpost, where they belong. I began pushing my way through the crowd until I was in front of them all. As of now Prim is under the protection of the Enclave, or as we are better known, the United States of America. I expected some mods to take over the NPCS and start yelling bullshit but just one of the mods was playing the NPCS. Mod was neutral and didn't give f about the lynch mob. After Prim was secured we brought in the radio beacons and the egos were deployed equally through the town, they served as a virtual alarm for hostiles. I went and talked to Nash, because he was the trader in town, and surprisingly I found EDE sitting on one of his tables. Nice bot dot bat. We do a little talking back and forth and he's about to make me pay for the robot. Speech roll. Well you did get them powder gangers out of town, and you are in charge now. It's yours. Get fucked. Conrad grabs the broken ass robot off the table and we walk out the door like we weren't only in there to get the robot. Get the beacons on the highest points of the roller coaster. Conrad finds a shitload of extension cords. We had moved all of our equipment to the hotel and found that if we moved the beacons to high points within the maximum distance of their wireless broadcasting that we could almost double the power of their broadcasting and receiving. Don't ask me how. I rolled a 18 in science. Now we just need some power. Does anyone know where we can get some generators and some fuel? I was outside the hotel so I was speaking aloud to everyone in earshot. Jack all walked up to my left and started going through his pockets. I don't know where any generators are but I had a bottle of gasoline for a chainsaw in one of my pockets. The fucking Molotov.robco. 
Don't worry about that I'll figure something else out. He fucking walks away confused to all hell. Eventually we settle on using a jury rigged wind turbine. We planned on powering the whole town for a morale boost. My face when it only could power the radio beacons at like 50% efficiency. By the way that wasn't a bad science role. It was just the GM being realistic saying we'd have to spend more time and money if wanted to give the town power. At the end of the first day we had powered the beacons at the minimum efficiency and gotten the radio set up. One ham radio for voice input, three beacons for jury rigged broadcasting, and one still broken eyeblitz to process any and all information that would absolutely overload the ham radios. I rolled well on the repair so the iBot was up and running pretty fast. I spent a few minutes going through its data, it was definitely an enclave iBot, a combat prototype of that. It was even better than I had recently presumed, it could take the full brunt force of the radio beacons and give us some really good intel on the NCR boss. The only downside was that the broadcasting power was only strong enough to get out into a 5 mile proximity. The current state of the beacon efficiency was part of the problem, but they weren't even made to broadcast anything. We spent a few days doing random tasks that would entrench our foothold in Prim. We built another turbine on top of the hotel, one on top of the casino, and one for the residential area of Prim. We destroyed the western bridge to the NCR camp, after we ransacked it and brought the prisoners across. The bison on top of the hotel was cut down and replaced with a flagpole and an enclave flag. After we put up the flag we realized that Prim was not self-sufficient, not in any great deal. The flag might in fact scare away any traders who could bring much needed supplies to Prim. What if we start broadcasting on the radio? You said it is only good enough for short distance broadcasting, when a trader gets close they'll hear the radio before they see the flag. If they know the town is open for business they might just ignore who owns it. Vulp had picked up on it fast. He understood what it meant for people to hate him without even understanding his politics. That might work, but we need a good message to send out. We can just say come all traders, we need your shit. Fat make it seem that we are going through a time of attrition. Conrad walked over to me from his position and began fiddling with his pip boy. The radius of the beacons are low, sure, but this one iced. He flipped on New Vegas radio. If he says on the radio that we took Prim from both the NCR and the Powder Gangers, people will know that it's safe. Good thinking Conrad, but the only issue is, how do we get him to tell everyone in the Mojave? We were silent, but he turned his gaze to the two youngest recruits. We already decided that it was a sacrifice worth making. Say if something bad doesn't happen to them, we can just broadcast on our radio until Mr. New Vegas is informed of what happened. I didn't respond to Conrad I just turned to Vulp and nodded. We sent the recruits that day, we gave them laser rifles and a few energy packs. If they did die, they'd take a few down with them. Their orders were to take at least 4 days to make the trek to the Mojave outpost, it only took 2. Make sure people saw them, and often say that they were a part of the enclave. If people asked what they were doing they'd say. After the captain won a decisive victory over the powder gangers and NCR at Prim we were ordered to put the prisoners back into the custody of the NCR. Four days after we sent the recruits out we got word from traders they had seen a few of our men transporting prisoners on the road. We confirmed that his was our men and when they moved on they carried word of our troops wherever they went. Eventually when the recruits didn't return, we assumed the worst until Mr. New Vegas came on the radio and started talking about us again. How are ya doing out there New Vegas? I got some more news for you here, let me get my newsman Fedora. A while ago I told you that Enclave troops were spotted in Bonnie Springs, fighting off an army of snake vipers, or so it goes. Well, they've been spotted again in Prim. The next day, the town had its entire population of powder gangers cleared out by the Enclave. If you go by the town you'll see an Enclave flag flying high over the Bison Steve Hotel. But that's not all folks. Traders coming from the Mojave outpost say that young enclave soldiers were transporting a group of NCR prisoners to the outpost. After the soldiers released the troopers, the NCR opened fire on them. I have contesting reports saying the two young men were shot to death and another report saying they successfully got away. I think I can speak for everyone listening when I say I hope those young men are okay, seeing that they were on a humanitarian mission and all. One of the NCR rangers here on the strip had this to say about the report. I don't care if they're little girls or boys who haven't even gotten hair on their chest. If you wear a knee, I will shoot you on sight. There's no mercy for the enclave scum.
I've got to say I don't think the Enclave feels all the same about Mercy here people, but I do know that the NCR sure don't like him. Let's get back to some tunes. My face when a real player said that in game to one of the Securitrons. My face when Mr. New Vegas put that on the radio. My face when the salt coming from the NCR is enough to make slugs go extinct. Over the course of two in-game weeks we attract traders into Prim. Using the traders as prospectors and gatherers we add another protectron and a sentry bot to our machine ranks. We designated the sentry bot as Ego 2.0. He's much more intimidating than the protectron egos, but has just as much personality. We knew that at times we won't be able to protect Prim, our main force might be absent. So we decided to put a man up for sheriff, after the people accepted him he deputized his two brothers. Effectively they kept people in check while we were busy sending out patrols and scavenging for needed supplies. It wasn't until the deputy from Bonnie Springs came with terrible news did we know that shit had officially hit the fan. Apparently when the boss and NCR got to the little town they didn't take a liking to the people who very openly supported us. They interrogated the sheriff and the mayor, when neither told them anything, they didn't know anything, they executed them for treason. You what mate? They air and even citizens. Iso. Apparently none of the edgy players understood anything about the political game I had been playing. All of Bonnie Springs took up arms against them, killing 4 players and 2 NPCs. In return the players killed everyone in the town, though they didn't target children they shot anyone they saw fighting, running, or otherwise. One of the Ranger Edge Lords had a post detailing his sniping of two farmers trying to run to Good Springs. I shit you not. They just massacred an entire town because EW Enclave supporters. We should get the deputy to the strip. If we can get him on the radio, New Vegas will turn against the NCR and boss. God damn it, no. I shook my head kicked a stool. Strength roll of 13. Kicked it a few feet away. There's no way we'd be able to get him there. Without us he might get there but as soon as he opens his mouth the NCR will silence him or Mr. New Vegas, permanently. The deputy had broken down once he had gotten to us, it was truly a sad sight to see him in such a condition. Vulp, send your fastest man to Good Springs, tell them we believe they are next on the enemy's hit list. We want them to evacuate to Prim immediately. I want you to see to it personally that every single trader that comes through Prim hears about what happened to Bonnie Springs. Also, I'll be taking Conrad and Richardson with me on a mission. I need you to see to it that in my absence that every man in Prim has a gun in his hands and knows how to use it. The NCR and boss are going to be coming for us and after I do what I do, they'll be extra fucking pissed. Me, Conrad, and Richardson set off that night at a light jogging pace. We were working against time and it had a bone to pick with us. A few hours before sunrise we met Velp's man on the road, almost all of Good Springs was with him. Apparently the main force of the lynch mob would hit Good Springs by dawn. We couldn't stay on the road anymore and risk running into the NCR or boss. Even with Richardson we would be easy prey to all that plot armor. Getting off the road we began heading north at paces to surpass the Metal Gear. But really we went at lightning speeds in comparison to before we had the egos. We made a like, weak trip in one night. We were south of Sloan when we had a GM random encounter. This encounter was meant to do one of two things. Give us something we need, or give us information we want. The random encounter was one all too familiar to myself. A fucking death claw. A death claw burst out from its den and began roaring at us. I did the perception check right away. Maybe I'd get a friend for Richardson. Nope. This guy was gravely injured. Bullet wounds and laser burnt flesh covered him. He was of course was on the brink of death. And there was no stopping the end for this big beauty. One thing I did notice though, that didn't involve its imminent death, was its immense size. It was obviously older than Richardson. It was at least a beta taller and its arms were longer. It was hands down the biggest death claw I had ever seen. One thing Richardson had going for him is that he was much faster and had more muscle mass. You see while death claws ate anything they could find, while it often consisted of longhorners, brahmin, or coyotes. The greatest delicacy for any carnivorous animal is human meat. Plenty of fat, plenty of muscle, and plenty of bone marrow. The wild death claw may have eaten a dozen humans in its life. Richardson? Double that within a month. That's not including the countless amounts of meat we can't eat that we gave to him. Richardson had been lagging behind for some time. He spotted a carcass and went to check it out. After realizing another death claw had killed the animal, it wasn't recognizable. 
he ran back to us. The big motherfucker was about to charge us when Richardson got between us. It was clear that Richardson was facing off against an alpha male. My character knew that non-alpha deathclaws wouldn't dare face an alpha unless mating was on the line. In pack vs pack fights the two alphas would fight. Either Richardson thought he was the alpha or he was defying all of his natural programming. Because as soon as the alpha reared up to try and intimidate Richardson. Which is what alphas do. Richardson initiated the attack without a second glance. The first few seconds were lightning speed slashes and punches. I could tell from what Richardson was doing, staying low and swinging low, that he wasn't trying to kill the alpha outright. He was measuring up how much of a threat the alpha was. Richardson pulled away in an instant and circled the battered alpha. It was strong. Richardson had allowed the alpha to hit him a few times on his neck and lower back, where his scales were thickest. Richardson had done some damage of his own but purposely nothing serious, just cut and slashed at the alpha's legs. A few seconds of circling later and Conrad raises his RCW to start shooting. No, if we do the beast will charge us and kill us. Richardson can take him down. Richardson stops in his circling and slashed the ground in front of him, putting huge holes in the earth. One thing you watch out for in the wild are holes like these. It means a death claw was sharpening their claws. The alpha came down on all fours and charged at Richardson. A few feet into its charge and it began limping. The attack Richardson made hadn't been a prodding attack, it was a strategy. Due to the injured legs the alpha was slow, even more so for another death claw, even more for Richardson. Richardson waited until the very last second to parry the alpha. In an attempt to keep Richardson out from behind him, which would have meant death, the alpha turned on its heels. It would have been better off running away. Richardson somehow understood balance. Seems like a strange concept, but Richardson understood that if you leaned forward, ITD be easier to be pushed forward. He also understood the general concept of kinetic energy and momentum. When the alpha turned, he'd be fighting against all of his own momentum. Timed with a perfect blunt strike of his shoulder, he put the alpha on its ass. The alpha didn't have any time to attempt to get up. Richardson was on top of him. Richardson's right leg pinning the alpha's left leg and Richardson's left leg dug into the ground for stability. After he cemented his pin on the alpha he began to rip apart his abdomen with huge arcing slashes with his claws. His head was down as to force the alpha to try and push him off with his arm strength, instead of trading blows with him. Which the alpha was far from able. In a last attempt to escape with its life the alpha kicked Richardson away with his right leg. The alpha flipped on its stomach. But before it could push itself off into a sprint Richardson planted his foot firmly on the back of the alpha's neck. The alpha tried once to get up but was met with Richardson pressing down hard with his talons. The alpha lay breathing hard under Richardson's tight grip, one eye looking right at Richardson. I wanted to call Richardson off, because this was the most unnatural thing I had ever seen Richardson, and Death Claws in general, do. But how could I? Richardson had just beat the ever-living shit out of the second most dangerous beast in the Mojave. The first being himself of course. Richardson didn't gloat for long to the dying alpha. A few growls and a few strange noises later and Richardson was done communicating. He reached down slowly and the alpha's flame went out with a deafening crunch. I guess death claw necks are harder to break. A few seconds after killing the alpha, Richardson reared up high and put his arms into the air with a truly magnificent roar. But in all honesty it sounded too much like a little roar. In all honesty he may have said war. I had heard that some very intelligent death claws could simulate human speech. They were known to mispronounce W's. Peter, this may be the coolest moment in my entire life. No, wait until you see the enclave. We gave Richardson a few seconds to bask in the sun before I called him over. He gazed at me then began sniffing at the air. It was unlike him to not do as I say, unless he thought there may be a threat. I turned and began surveying the area. Nothing. When I got back to looking at Richardson he began slowly jogging in the direction the death claw had come from. Let's go see what he's looking for. We watched as Richardson crested a hill, turned his head and began his descent down towards the unknown. When we followed me and Conrad looked like we had just seen a gold mine, Richardson wasn't jogging anymore. He had his head close to the ground sniffing at the quickly thrown together nest. And it's seven unborn inhabitants. Holy shit. Conrad. Shit can't be holy. Shut the fuck up. We approached the nest and crouched down to look at the eggs. So it turns out Conrad. Richardson just beat the ever living shit out of an alpha female. 
there's possibly two options here for us. Either the male was nearby, meaning the female wouldn't mate with Richardson. Or Richardson didn't give a fuck and just wanted to kill her. Or he killed her for the eggs. I looked at Richardson and pondered the possibility for a minute. Why? She was obviously going to die soon whether or not Richardson tore her a new one or not. He knew she wouldn't give up her eggs willingly, it was a mercy killing to save her eggs. I looked at Richardson again and searched his eyes for some deeper plan. It was obvious to me that Richardson was much smarter than he seemed, and he seemed to be one of the smartest death claws ever. Richardson knew the female, maybe it was his mother, but he knew her nonetheless. Conrad looked at me confused as Richardson leaned in close to listen. He saw her and knew something was wrong. Think about it from the perspective of Richardson. Say this was his mother. Why would she be so hurt and near death in the middle of nowhere? Why would she put her eggs in a thrown together nest without another death claw in sight? Wherever Richardson's pack was living is ransacked, overrun, destroyed. If I am right he knows this and knows he can only preserve his pack by seeing to it that these eggs survive. Sometimes it scares me how smart he is. For a death claw, Richardson finds a way to give me a look of gloom. I must have been dead on the money. After we dumped out Conrad's bag and placed the eggs safely inside we began a slower pace north, past Sloan. We always kept the road to our left as we would use it as a sort of indicator of our location, if we got into a fi fight and had to think fast. A little past Sloan, Richardson stops in his tracks and stared off into the distance across the road. Oh no dot feels. What was apparently a mine of sorts had a single entrance. Beside the entrance was a big construction vehicle, obviously broken down for some time. But in the entrance to the mine were dozens of death claws, piled on top of one another like sacks of grain. I looked at Richardson and for some reason expected to see him sobbing. A cold and emotionless gaze was all I received. In this moment I realized that Richardson was so much like me it was scary. He was saved only because he was too young to fight. His entire family, all of his people, slaughtered for what they were. I understood that some would say it must have been done, but for Richardson it was a realization about the world of man. Mercy had been alienated when people gave up on the old world. Luckily Richardson met me. Someone he could align himself with. How did me and Conrad feel? We were just glad Richardson was on our side. Imagine something like him if it was out to kill humanity as a whole. We gave Richardson a few minutes to take it all in, had need to have that fire in his heart for the battle to come. After he had his fill he turned away and followed our slow pace down the road. Peter, you never did tell me the plan. Is it time to take action against the boss and NCR? We had talked out our plan in PMs because fuck these boss boys know how to meta game. But they were also ignorant. Ever since we started turning people against them they began to take every action we made very seriously. No, the time for action is not yet upon us, but soon it will be. There is still one more thing to be said before we can face the enemy in force. What do you mean? The time for war is now. We can just keep playing these games of peekaboo with the enemy, thieves slaughtered people openly because they won't hate us. I gritted my teeth, turned on my heel, and hit Conrad as hard as I could. For most it would send them on their ass. For Conrad it sent him back a few steps before bumping into Richardson, who stopped him from falling. You don't think I fucking know that? They wiped more than half of the Enclave's population from existence Conrad. They attacked us mercilessly when we had obviously lost already. After they destroyed the headquarters in Washington they moved from outpost to outpost and massacred us. When they found our mobile fortress, they destroyed it without even trying to get the children out. They backed my people in a corner and kept fucking shooting. Conrad I've tried showing you why I do what I do, but let me try to put it into terms anyone would understand. The enclave is on its last legs. We can't fail again, or humanity is going to spiral into death with the last of us. I have to take every precaution to see to it that we win this. Stop treating things as if they're a game. We will all die Conrad, every single man, woman, and child, until they can enslave us. We can't live that life, so they'll drive us into extinction. Conrad stared at me and I could feel the regret flood over him. He took my issues seriously but never saw the bigger picture. He thought that this was one of many enclave victories. Ignorant of how much death was brought to my people. I couldn't blame him for being confused or having his fun loving view. But changing his view would have to be learned with a serious emotional, physical, and intellectual outburst. I am sorry Peter. 
I know I haven't been taking this as seriously as I should, it's hard to see myself on the losing end of a conflict such as this. I can put myself in your shoes or see what you have seen. I gave Conrad a few seconds then I patted his shoulder. Yalv never faced defeat Conrad. That's the only reason you don't understand. As the enclave has been reduced to just over a few thousand old men and women, I've learned that our defeat will come with the price of our people as a whole. I hope you never have to face such things. We talked back and forth for some time before Conrad pondered a question. So, what are we doing? I smiled and pointed at a radio station a few mile away. We're going to siege the Black Mountain. Of course we were doing this for dramatic effect, we had already planned a lot of shit out in PMs. The siege was us putting the lynch mob's king in check. So how will we do it? Vulp said the Black Mountain is infested with mutants. Our friends in the Legion will help us, few mutants are smart enough to formulate a strategy. One on one they are a huge threat, but with 20 of us and Richardson to make sure they can't get close. They'll be mincemeat. So we set out up a road towards the peak of the mountain, eventually we came across a shack and a friendly mutant. Conrad called them green niggers. I suppose it's true then, the enclave really is in the Mojave. Are you here to wipe us out? Conrad is unaware of the super mutant and enclave past. We're here to take the mountain. Then you know that most of the mutants won't go without a fight. Just because you have a death claw, you think you can clear out the mountain? At this time I nod to Conrad who aims the flare gun in the air and shoots it. The mutant winced at the bright light in the sky. The legion will be here soon to help us take the mountain. If you have any friends on the mountain you want to save, now is the time. He didn't respond to me. He turned and began sprinting up the road until he was out of sight. So mutants are just as smart as us. No, very few of them are intelligent. Those who are, are also very experienced in the wasteland. They know who and who not to fuck with. This entire time Richardson just scratched his ass. We didn't have to wait long before we spotted a legion scout peering over a rock a few hundred yards away. A few minutes later our centurion friends jogged onto the road we were on from a path in the hills. We expected a dozen or so legionnaires. What we got was nearly 40 soldiers, 3 cohorts. Vulp's brother walked up to me and gave me a forearm shake. How are you friend? How is my brother? I am well and so is he, I see your retinue has grown larger. Yes, since you began gaining notoriety in the wasteland, the NCR has pulled men off the border to send to kill you. Caesar has sent more cohorts into the Mojave, the time to strike the dam is near because of you. I never would have guessed you belong to the tribe of the Enclave, we've heard stories about your people's power. Obviously cringe shit. Centurion bro is edgy, but his story is absolutely fantastic once I read his posts. Centurion of the 13th Scouting Legion turned to a Primus Pillars, leading a war party in the Mojave. Guy raided the NCR prison and the beginning of the game to get his cohort out. He successfully attacked and destroyed half of Boulder City while escorting an injured Tribune. Guy is dangerous in his own right, would not fuck with him. Why have you signaled as friend? I smiled and pointed at the top of Black Mountain. We will soon begin a frontal attack against the NCR and the boss. First I need to take the mountain and the radio station. When are we to attack? As soon as you think your men will be ready, it's infested with mutants. Centurion bro turned his head and gave the other legion player a signal. Legion bros draw swords, spears, and machetes, a few even have some dank looking shields. If you are facing the the enemies of the legion, you have our full support. Let's get this done. We begin a steady march up the road until we come across the generation 1 mutant and a few other mutants. We're no threat to you or the enclave, we want to leave. Leave then. Once the mutants leave, centurion bro asks me why I let them live. Generation 1 mutants can be a deadly adversary or a powerful ally. In the future we may come across the same mutant, and see him as a friend. He nods and we continue up the road until we are attacked by Nightkin. I knew about Nightkin. I knew they were very dangerous. They didn't know about Richardson. As soon as one of them charged at us with its huge sword. Richardson emerged from some bushes and was on top of it before it could blink. In all honesty visualizing us against the mutants went like this all the way up the mountain. Three or four mutants would charge at us. Richardson would pounce on one and rip it to shreds. The rest of us would dogpile the others until we were able to kill them. Every so often one of the mutants would swing a rebar club and hit one of the legionnaires with a shield. By the time we got to the top of the mountain we had suffered three deaths and six injuries. 
On the other hand we had killed 20 mutants. If they attacked us in force it would have been a real shit fest. After we got past the mutants shitty shacks we found the radio station. And. We found a big fucking nightkin dressed up as a girl. Peter. What in the name of Uncle Sam is that thing? Some of these mutants are retarded. I looked over at the big fucker. Really fucking retarded. The legion guys look at me while this nightkin is talking to itself. Conrad tosses me a PM and I shit a brick. Do it bro.jpg. Conrad gives me his RCW and takes the Viper Leader sword out of my bag. I still had it. Imagine a single edge European sword. Technically a fortune but I sent as retarded looking. You know if God made me in his image. He was really fucking around when he made you. Full retard engaged dot nuka. Big blue fuck charges at Conrad swinging wildly. Conrad ducks and rolls under the swings. Although he does get a glancing hit on the back of his head. Once he's back up, he's laughing and smiling. Tell me Peter, is your friend insane? Legion bro has never met the Conrad that is able to beat the fuck out of armies of men. No, he just really likes fighting. Somewhere out there in the wastes is a vault full of people like him. Legion bro does this. His eyes widen as he looks back at the fighting. It's been a few minutes in the fight and big blue bitch is getting tired. Instead of swinging wildly and trying to hit Conrad. The big fucker is just trying to catch him. When Conrad knows the fucker can't catch him he starts putting in some damage. Every time he ducks under a swing or slips out of a grip he'll hit the fucker as hard as he can in the head. If it was a human I reckon that ITD be on the ground spazzing out with its brain absolutely destroyed by now. Conrad PMs me some shit to say in game. Big of my dude pip boy. Conrad go ahead and finish it, we have work to do. Conrad responds by sidestepping the big blue bitch's next attack to the left. Once he had gotten out of the way he turned with lightning speed and swung down as fast as he could. He amputated the mutant's arms. Halfway up the forearm he chopped them clean off. The big fuck went straight into the ground and began yelling in agony. Conrad walked back over to me and took his RCW back. He didn't turn to the mutant but he aimed his gun at it and just held the trigger until it was out of charge. Why did you have to do that vault dweller? I don't know, because it was fun to beat the hell out of a big blue nigger? Legion Bros didn't respond. So what is the plan now, Peter? The plan is to bring the people of the Mojave to our side. That's our part here. For you on the other hand, are you willing to help us face the enemy in the frontal assault? The Legion guys looked at each other then nodded to me. Good, because we'll need you to get as many men as possible. We can gather 5 more cohorts by nightfall, what's the plan? I smiled and scratched my head. Listen to the radio tonight, you'll know what to do. They didn't wait to talk anymore, they just fucked right off into the hills. Unlike the lynch mob, the Legion bros played by the rules of NPC communication. They'd have to travel to a specific safe house and contact other cohorts. Lynch mob just magist in a couple NPCs whenever they wanted. Boss scribe bitch even magically found a group of boss knights wandering around the wasteland. GM gas their NPCs a lot. So what's our next move? You're gonna leave with Richardson. I want you back to Prim by midday, and back here by midnight. Conrad is mega fucking confused. What are you gonna do? I have to get our plan ready. Strap your backpack to Richardson and run as fast as possible. He just stares at me, still confused. I won't be able to get the plan ready without staying here, and we can't get Vulp and the men up here without having one of us getting a message to them pronto. Alright, so what's your part of the plan? Listen to the radio, you'll figure it out. Conrad hesitated but strapped his bag to Richardson and began a running pace down the mountain. I told him to be there midday, he'd be there before lunch. When Conrad was a few hundred feet away I sat against a wall and sighed. Time to have my character's willpower break for a little while. When you're in my character's position sometimes you just gotta cry a little bit. Pull a fury and have a breakdown for about half an hour. Once I got myself back together I walked up to the radio station and made my way inside. Place was a wreck, but the retarded mutants were smart enough not to smash all of the equipment. I spent several hours in game fixing equipment, or connecting unused pieces that were hidden away in the back of the station. Before I started working on the radio's broadcasting strength it might have been able to get to a fifth of the Mojave. By the time I finished it could ping off every single radio in New Vegas and broadcast for miles outside of it. Two hours before sunset I opened up four channels. Three broadcasting on frequently used public frequencies, and one a secured line. 
Static filled the airwaves as the broadcast came into tune. Sweet America, hello again, this is President John Henry Eden. I'd like to have a chat. The Enclave is back, America. Ah, no, not just on your radio. Right now Enclave troops are patrolling the capital wasteland. These fine men and women, under the command of the stalwart Colonel, Augustus Autumn, have one mission. The restoration of American peace and order. But let's hear from the man himself, shall we America? I give you Colonel Augustus Autumn. The broadcast pauses for a second before a new voice is heard. Thank you Mr. President. People of the Capital Wasteland, I am Colonel Autumn. By now, you have encountered Enclave troops in your towns, in your settlements. When you see the Enclave, you see the United States government. We are authorized to restore order and civility, by any means necessary. Just stay out of the way and let us do our job. Interfere with the Enclave's mission, and you will be dealt with, harshly. Another pause occurs as the first voice resumes speaking. Very good Colonel, very good. So, there you have it, my darling America. Enclave troops are now in your neighborhoods, in your lives, in your hearts. Together, we will restore the glory of this great nation. One problem at a time. So remember America, the Enclave is working around the clock to return this country to greatness. All you need is a little patience. A little faith. Until next time, this is your president, John Henry Eden, signing off. This same message looped on for an hour. Little by little the people of the Mojave tuned in and listened patiently. They had heard so much about the Enclave. Was this really all there was though? A simple looping message? Just as some were beginning to lose interest an alien voice came through the static. That was the last radio broadcast our president sent out to the people of Washington. Four years ago. Many of my brothers died as they took up arms against their attackers. Before we could fight back our president was dead. Before we could get the children away, the colonel was dead. Our punishment for the crimes we committed was absolute destruction and extermination of our people. I hear you asking yourself, what crimes did the enclave commit? That's simple my fellow Americans, so simple in fact that I think even our enemies will understand. We refuse to let America die. We fought against a technological autocracy by trying to free our fellow Americans from their grip. We shielded innocents from the terrors of the wasteland. On every front we faced our enemies, and sacrificed our lives so that Americans may have a chance to survive. We put a hundred years of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears into a gift to give freely to our fellow Americans. My family gave their lives to see to it that no longer would Americans falter under the oppression of false heroes. You may have heard about the recent attacks, or maybe you haven't. Bonnie Springs and Good Springs are wiped off the map, their inhabitants dead or in hiding with us. Their crimes against the NCR and the Brotherhood of Steel was treason. Treason of the highest caliber. Such a terrible crime that the NCR killed women and children as they fled. Tortured captives and executed the injured and defenseless. Yes, I must say my fellow Americans, yes. Refusing to take up arms as a slave against those that protect you, is surely the greatest crime that could be committed. Refusing to be used as a weapon to destroy freedom truly is a great crime. Yet they won't stop there, not even there will they stop punishing the treasonous. Now they send an army of murderers to Prim, where we have tried to protect those who could not protect themselves. I know many of you fear for their lives, but do not. I am but a single man, America, and I have caused my greatest enemies to shudder in fear. They do not fear my weapons or my skills. They fear the truth I hold, no, they fear the love I hold for America. Even as I speak they are trying to plan a way to force the Enclave into submission. Yet they still do not understand that there is no lengths I won't go to to see that we, as a country, win this. I paused to take in a deep breath. My people, sons and daughters of America. For too long have we been a broken nation, we have been shunned, oppressed. You've been conquered by those you sought to escape. 200 years ago, the leaders of this great nation asked for time. When we went to war we knew that only the truest of Americans might survive, and the time we asked for was granted by you, you, the strength in my arm, the holders of my dreams. In a time such as this, I vow this much, the history of these days will be written in blood. Throughout America we will be fighting, by crushing the armies of our enemies, by seizing the weapons they thought to turn against us, we will be fighting for our very existence. As we destroy their forces they will be given the opportunity to parley and allowed to surrender. But if there are those who would deny us peace, refuse us our rightful place on this earth, 
Then we shall unleash such terrible vengeance, that generations yet unborn will cry out in anguish. For many lifetimes, we have suffered unbearable hardships. Banished by our enemies, to die from disease, from famine, thieves guard us, thieves weakened us, but that time has passed. For too long have we worked away on empty stomachs, slowly rebuilding our strength, our pride, and our nation, only to be destroyed again by our enemies, but that time has passed. Our forefathers embarked on the greatest journey in the history of all mankind. A quest for freedom, America became that freedom, but in the dawn of a new age we were struck down by our enemies, into a wasteland, this wasteland. This new world changed us, at first it weakened us. But in fact, we became stronger. In the time you have given the enclave we have rebuilt our pride, we have rebuilt our strength, and soon we will rebuild our nation. Those who defy us shall face a swift death, or a humble surrender. And for those who disagree with us peacefully? We will give them new insights into our cause. Many of them know now what they have done, so through the kindness only a father can have for a child, the enclave shall grant them mercy. Yet this is not a day for mercy, today is a day of unification. Today is the day we demand our freedom. On this day we stand united again. On this day, those driven to divide us, will hear our voice. On this day we shall act as one, we shall be ignored no more. From the skies we shall smite the usurpers of our great nation. And though they sweep through our land like the sands of winter, never again will we bow before them. Never again will we fail our people. Never again will we endure their oppression. Never again endure their tyranny. We will strike the enemies of freedom without warning and without mercy. Fighting as one hand, one heart, one soul. We will shatter their dreams and haunt their nightmares. We shall drench our families' graves with their blood. And as the last breath tears at their lungs, as we rise from the ashes of our nation, they will know that the twilight of a new age has engulfed them people of America. Now is, our time. Throughout the wasteland listeners turn toward the NCR and Brotherhood of Steel. Not as civilians or settlers, but as members of a pack. Their eyes drew a predatory gaze as they stood from their shacks, campfires, and ruined buildings. A nationalist spirit of rebellion was burned into the heart of almost every listener, and a match was all that was needed to connect the burning hearts. A single action to unite them into a grand inferno against the enemies of the enclave. Against the enemies of America. As soon as the broadcast ended I flipped off the radio transmission and smashed the broadcasting equipment with a hammer. After I grabbed my gun and backpack I booked it outside and was met with the darkness of midnight. Down in the first camp I could see dozens of lights, easily 50 or more. The lynch mob was coming for me. I jumped from the stairs of the radio station and rolled down a hill for a few seconds before getting back to my feet and sprinting at top speeds. The NCR and boss were marching straight up the road, which meant that they'd not find me very soon and begin a fox hunt. I was back at the foot of the mountain when I heard the yelling and screaming of NCR sharpshooters spotting me and calling out my location to everyone else. They had about 25 players in the lynch mob, and about 50 NPCs. Me getting a good enough speed roll to outrun all of them was impossible. But outrunning them was never the plan. I got about halfway between Black Mountain and Sloan before the first lynch mobber was less than a hundred feet behind me. I dropped my backpack, turned, and shot the closest fucker in the chest. It killed the fucker, and he raged royally in the oak because it's not fair that he can just turn and shoot at us. I keep running until I came across the quarry, and the bodies. Getting to Sloan was impossible. Getting to the quarry, was possible. I leapt over the pile of death claws and hit the ground running. After I hit the ground I sprinted at full speed for about 15 seconds before I realized there was no other exit to the quarry. I stop in my tracks and turn to see 6 or 7 lynch mobbers coming through the entrance. My only chance of surviving is to solid snake these fuckers. I hip, skip, hop, jump, duck, and dive my way over to the nearest crane. The big machinery hasn't been used since the Great War, or even longer. I look over the crane and get a feel for the stability of it. Spiderboy.aol. I start climbing the crane until I am about 20 feet up. Now the quarry is filled to the very brim with the lynch mob. Every other faggot is in power armor, and most of the NCR faggots are veteran rangers with a terrible backstory. One guy is literally a one-eyed cripple who is unable to walk, but gets carted around by trooper because he's a really good shot. I am sitting here watching them peer around the quarry like a bunch of retards. After a while they start getting into search groups and start looking for me in the little caves. 
Bad idea Fadget. You see there was one or two players that always meet a gamed me, and they were at the moment just camping the crane, waiting for me to make some sort of post so they can just magically see me. Instead of being a good player and Raul playing. I rolled for accuracy and speed. Crit the accuracy and get 17 on the speed. I jump down from my hiding spot and shoot the first guy in the face. Get slimed. Nickelodeon. The second guy yells out before I shoot him right in the temple. Apparently every motherfucker around here heard a half a second yelp. Everyone fucking closes in on me. Do an emergency search roll on one of the dead guys. Has a frag grenade. I grab it and chuck it behind me. Kill an NPC and initiate John Wick mode. I am going from support pillar to support pillar shooting at the closing in horde. So far I've killed 4 of them, and John Wick mode is only slowing them down. Eventually they're close enough to swing at me. They obviously want to take me alive. Enemy does a speed roll. Crits and knocks me out from behind. For about 2 hours in game I am knocked right the fuck out. Lynch mob has taken this time to bitch at one another about how it was their fault that this fascist got this far. Once I am awake I get literally bombarded by the edge lords with their snowflake monologues. How could you do this? Why are you so evil? ETC ETC. For about 20 in game minutes they are trying to make me feel bad for being my character. Faggots don't get that my character doesn't monologue and bitch like they all do. Eventually the dialogue dies down until I am just sitting here listening to a couple faggots making them feel better about themselves. Eventually boss scribe bitch makes her way over. Talked shit non-stop. Looks like we finally caught you, you will pay for what you've done. Throughout this entire monologue shit show I've literally not made a single post. They thought I was but hurt. Wrong. What have I done? Bitch spends literally 10 minutes trying to think some shit up. You represent the most hateful and oppressing faction in the wasteland. Yalv killed people in their name, and want to bring war to the Mojave. Too easy. I represent my people, I've killed only to protect my people, and I will bring freedom to the Mojave, for my people. Girl stutter types for a while because she's got no clue on how to respond to that. I don't even give her the time of day. Do you believe yourselves to be good people? Do you really think Yalv accomplished anything by capturing a single robotics technician? Fear at max speeds. You think that I am some big bad wolf that'll haunt you in the night, do you? Surely you thought this through, I mean you do know what Yalv done, don't you? One of the NCR rangers steps forward to put in her two cents. We've brought an end to your crimes. Really, my crimes? Wasn't it you people that slaughtered an entire town? They started shooting we had no choice. I laughed in their face. Because you tortured and murdered their mayor, my god. You all really do believe in this false narrative. I giggle and yawn, unscared of them. One of the less cringy boss guys steps in. What are you talking about? You all really do think you're some kind of heroes. You think that people see you as gods. You fucking fools you aren't the heroes of this story. Some random boss fag punches me in the gut, fall to my knees and giggle a little for edge points. That's it. Silence me like you did those children in Bonnie Springs. You errant heroes. None of you are. Those among you who would have been heroes already left your groups long ago. I got back on my feet and smiled at them all. I know it's hard to fathom how far you've fallen. Yet, I've always known how detrimental you were to our great nation. It's good to finally see you show your true colors. They all were getting their jimmies rustled. Bad. A very seldom few among them were rethinking the past events. I scanned through the quarry as I stretched my legs. A few hundred feet away I could see Conrad's blonde hair and pale skin just barely visible over Iraq. Good, he was there. Meant he knew what was going down. I gotta say, you did pick a beautiful morning to catch your villain. Honestly, it'd rather be playing baseball than be playing the part of the bad guy with all of you. I looked at my Pip-Boy and saw the time. I gritted my teeth and sighed. Just under an hour before first light. What I won't give to throw a football right now. I gulped and took a deep breath. Without warning I charged the boss scribe bitch and completely knocked her on her ass. She didn't hesitate to shoot me right in the chest while on her back. I dropped to the ground like a stiff log. All of the lynch mob is what the fucking at this bitch. Well fuck me. The shot to my chest is bad. Really bad. My muscles are tensed up to the slow the bleeding and I am trying not panic or let my adrenaline get to my head. Boss scribe says this in Ook yes I get points for killing the fascist. All the lynch mobbers saying cheesy shit in the Ook and liking each other's post for about 5 minutes. 
GM starts typing a post up. As Peter is lying in agony on the ground, all around the quarry dozens of flares are shot off into the sky. Almost all of them coming from the entrance. They all turn to the entrance of the quarry to see Vulp and Jack all standing there with almost a hundred armed settlers and Roberts. One of the boss drops his gun and says. Just a robotics technician. They all get ready to start firing at Vulp as they hear a blood curdling war cry from behind them. Boss cry bitch turns just in time to get cut in two. From shoulder to hip. When she fell down a blue vault suit was standing in her place. Attack. The lynch mob turned to find over a hundred legion soldiers, a pissed off death claw, and the racist vault dweller. The lynch mob didn't have time to get off any shots before the legion made it a full out melee. A boss paladin charges at Conrad, only to be met by Richardson. Richardson grabbed the power armor demon by his head and slammed him down. He pinned him with a foot on his pelvis. He let out a huge roar as he leaned down and tore the man in half. He chunked the body at a few NCR fags hiding behind a rock shooting into the free. I watched idly as Conrad chopped and slashed at everyone and everything around him. For a minute we had them on their heels, but they had power armor and big fucking guns. Conrad, followed by three legion, got to me and began rallying the troops to protect me. God damn Conrad, you really got her. He smiled and raised up from behind a dead body to shoot at a few NCR. Two more legion ran past the body Conrad was using and clashed with a boss knight who was advancing on us. Don't worry Peter, we've got you now. Legion, get some medics over, the captain's hurt. I roll to my side as to clench my chest more tightly. I am gone Conrad, once the outside wound is shut nothing will stop the arteries from killing me in seconds. Conrad looked at me in horror. What fuck are you talking about? I said it myself, they had no idea what lengths it'd go to. Out of the corner of my eye I saw boss paladin burst out of the bulk of the fighting and charge us. A few of the legion counter charged but were knocked down. Conrad started unloading his RCW but it didn't do shit. About 5 yards before he could get to Conrad I saw Jack all jump on the guy's back with a stick of dynamite. The paladin stopped and tried to get Jack all off of him. Jack all was trying to stick it in his power armor's hatch valve. When he figured it wouldn't work he wrapped his arms around the paladin's neck. Boom. It blew the paladin's head clean off, and took half of Jack all with it. The lines of battle were evening out as Vulp charged into the fighting with the militia he had put together. Using that he pushed the lynch mob back and regained ground on them. By the time we had secured our troops and the melee was over, half of us were dead while a third of the lynch mob was dead. We had taken out most of their NCR but the Brotherhood fags all had power armor. Both of our centurions were fine but only 30 of the initial 100 legion were alive. Vulp's men had suffered about 20 casualties. The egos were serving as cannon fodder in our advances on them. There were 150 of us, and 50 of the lynch mob left. Vulp and Conrad are trying to talk to me while Centurion Bros are holding the line. God fuck, he's really fucked up. What can we do? We'd need gallons of blood to make sure he didn't die in surgery. This is a battlefield, there's not a surgery gonna happen you fools. They spend a few minutes bickering back and forth while Richardson is killing the injured lynch mobbers we captured. Was that really your plan Peter? Get yourself shot? One hell of a signal. I laughed a little and patted Conrad's leg. It wasn't a part of the plan, and it wasn't the signal. But we had no time, I had to wing it. I forced out a last smile then rolled on my back, releasing the, the tension in my chest and relaxing my muscles. It'd be dead in just a few seconds. But not before I saw them, like knights of yore on the horizon. Their name? The Enclave. Their mission? To protect the freedoms of any and all Americans. Overhead a squad of vertibuds swooped over the battle and unleashed a tendril of fire upon the lynch mob. As my eyes blazed over, Conrad picked up his sword and held it up high as he ran past our men and charged into the arms of the enemy. For the Enclave. As he clashed into the boss and NCR horde, all of the legion and the militia followed him. The enclave troops smashed the lynch mob and joined the melee with Conrad. It was a slaughter. As enclave troops slaughtered the boss they yelled out into the morning light. For Captain Richardson. Not a single boss or NCR was left alive in the end, but lying peacefully in a seemingly sleepless state was Peter Richardson, direct descendant of the last true president of the United States. After the battle was over they crowded my body and saluted my corpse. Richardson, Vulp, and Conrad mourned as the legion burned the dead NCR and boss. 
In one fell swoop we destroyed 90% of the player base and the roleplay. Conrad, Vulp, and the Legion would join with the Enclave in arms against the NCR and boss. The lynch mob would make new characters and try to fight off the Enclave. I didn't make a new character. I had to help bring a chapter to an end. And bring a twilight of a new age into the world. Epilogue. Word of my death spread quickly all over the Mojave. A single flame was extinguished by the dirt and mud, but many more took up my mantle. Soon after the Enclave began a full invasion on the Mojave, the Legion attacked the dam. From west the Legate led a huge attack force. From the east Conrad and Vault led the militia. From the skies the Enclave tore at any shred of hope the NCR had. The last of the boss gathered a small group to try and fight off the attackers. Enclave traitors were even found among the weak resistance. Each hung from the neck until dead. 200 Enclave troops were spread throughout the Mojave. In Novak the citizens came out one by one and surrendered until a few NCR lackeys were left. The town was purged of the NCR terrorists and the citizens were left in peace. In West Side, Enclave troops were welcomed with open arms. NCR and boss refugees were dragged out of their hiding places and executed on the spot for high treason against the US government. Up north a militia patrol discovered a contingent of NCR troopers who had been harassing a mutant settlement, and due to the loss of the dam were now without large support or orders. A single Enclave Verti bird was used to send word to the settlement that the Enclave had ejected most of the NCR from the Mojave. These troops were not backed by an army of NCR fodder. The Enclave wanted no quarrel with the mutants so the envoy left after relaying the message. The NCR remnants were slaughtered without mercy by the mutants and an enclave deserter was surrendered to a militia squadron. In the matter of two months most, if not all, of the NCR had been driven out or killed in the Mojave. A few strongholds were still left, but enclave and legion forces rallied together for the ensuing battles. Our centurion friend sieged forlorn hope and within two days they had crucified every single soldier within the fort. After Camp Golf was burned to the ground Conrad and Volt led a full-scale attack on Camp McCarran. They led a 300-man strong militia, dubbed the New Enclave Army. Within a day they had dragged out and executed the soldiers, and sold those that surrendered to the Legion. It was chance that it happened but an Enclave Reckon team stumbled upon Hidden Valley. An attack force made up of 4 Enclave death squads, 50 militia, 30 Legion, and Conrad attacked the place. The boss truly knew how it felt to lose their families. In the end only the children of the boss were left alive. In accordance to Enclave law they were not to be harmed, but instead re-educated in the Enclave school system. Only two NCR strongholds were left when the dust of the lightning fast Enclave tactics settled. New Vegas itself. And the Mojave outpost. There was not a chance for either to survive but a show of power must be made. A simultaneous attack on both would have to occur. Volt led an attack on the outpost with the new Enclave army. While Conrad led three Enclave squads in an attack on the NCR at the Strip. They had gravely misread the data and were terribly outnumbered. They suffered several casualties. Even Richardson had been injured. When it seemed that they would all die. The people of Freeside and the Strip revealed themselves. With Enclave armbands and a burning inferno of patriotism they rose up and attacked the NCR in the streets. The kings led an ambush against the NCR from the back alleys and roofs. Within minutes the tides of battle turned and the NCR were all but destroyed in the Mojave. In the end the NCR was crippled, and the boss was no longer an entity in the Mojave. The legion was given no land or pay for the blood they shed, but a warning. The US government is back. We will allow you to go through the Mojave outpost to the west where you can expand and enslave at your heart's desire. But, you will not lay a hand on any child, you will surrender any and all children you capture to the Enclave. Our side of this agreement is that the Enclave will defend you if there ever is a time when the Legion is pushed back into the Mojave. We will hold this land against the NCR and slaughter our enemies wherever they are found. Do not make yourself one of them, the Legion didn't even try renegotiating this. They expanded west and left the Mojave to the growing Enclave. But what happened to our heroes? Vulp was granted the his freedom to do as he pleased because of how highly the Enclave spoke of him. He bred and trained dogs in Prim for a few years until he got word that an old friend in the east had cut out a nice piece of land for himself. Vulp rounded up a few other Legion veterans and headed east with his retinue of beasts and men. The Centurion Bros were promoted to tribunes and were the only two Legion men permitted to treat with the Enclave, other than Caesar himself. They were announced to be the greatest politician warriors in the Legion. Most of the egos lay destroyed in the Battle of the Deathclaw Canyon.
but through sheer luck one of the memory drives was found and installed into any protectrons that were repaired or found. The Enclave rebuilt a Robco factory south of West Side. Hundreds of protectrons were built. Hundreds of egos now patrolled the Mojave. On almost every corner in a settlement an egg or is stationed. All crime in cities and towns plummet due to this. The strip was kept almost in touch when the Enclave moved in. Except for the lucky 38. Enclave troops assaulted it and killed whatever was inside. After that all securitrons were deactivated and scrapped for parts. The kings of Freeside were given the duty to protect it, along with egg or assistance, and report directly to the governor of the Mojave. The Silver Rush was ransacked by Enclave agents, the owners of the establishment were dragged out and shot for crimes against the United States. Unlike the Brotherhood of Steel the energy weapons were studied, broken down, and manufactured to be sold to the new Enclave army. Energy weapons sold by the Enclave were reserved for knee personnel and almost all ballistic weapons were sold to the people of the Mojave for near to nothing. No longer were Americans helpless to attacks by raiders. The dam was restored to working capacity and soon hit 100% efficiency. Enclave scientists replicated a nearly perfect purifier, mirroring the one meant to be put to use in the capital wasteland. Tens of thousands of people no longer drank brown irradiated water. They could smile and drink happily. Enclave biologists replicated a few species of fish and soon the Colorado River was filled with edible fish. Even ghouls and mutants drank from the river. And after they drank they looked to see the Enclave staring at them. The Enclave directed and moved all ghouls and mutants up to Jacobstown, peacefully. That is where they became an independent city-state but they still held close ties with the Enclave. So close that, in the case of a few super mutants from the town, some became members of the new Enclave army. They were equipped with special armor to accommodate their large size. The death claw eggs we found were given to the Enclave and soon they began breeding a frontline force of intelligent death claws. Some of them could speak a few words. Now we come to our final hero. Conrad. The vault dweller who left his home as a conqueror, a champion, and a hero. Now as this story comes to an end he is a true conqueror, a real champion, and the most renowned hero on the west coast. But what happened to Conrad? Where has this victory sent him? Will we ever see Conrad again? Conrad left the Mojave, never to be seen in the region again. Some say he travels the wasteland destroying anything he deems to be un-American. Others say he travels to his vault to lead his people to a life of conquest. But in reality? Conrad heads east where John Henry Eden, the last president, was murdered by usurpers of America. He didn't go alone. Jesus fuck, what a story. Like, you know, honestly, I think this is one of the best, better ones I've done in a long time, if I'll be honest with you. Um, I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed it. I, there were so many parts in it that felt really cinematic, and I loved, you know, thinking, like, you know, because it's all, you know, like, we've all played Fallout New Vegas for countless hours. Like, you know, I'm in the thousands of hours of playtime on that game. So, like, you know, I've... I, 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 I know what they're on about, and I love whenever they mention, like, NPCs. Like, you know, like, even, like... Um, Deputy Beagle and all that, you know, I, I really enjoy that and um, there's something about it, I like the continuity I really enjoy the continuity but, uh, no, before I start gushing anymore, I need to get this out so, look, in the comments, I constantly get how do I join in on this, where do I go, how are they playing this game you know, etc, etc and I've got tons and tons of comments with links to websites with role playing communities and stuff. For me, I only really know of Quest on 4chan, that would be the only one I would go to. Um, but I'll put all the links down below. Uh, because they're links, they get put into my spam folder instantly so they don't even get published. Um, I'll go through it all, get them all in the description, so definitely go ahead and check that out. If you want to join in yourself, I can only recommend it, like, you know. But, of course, I would say, if it's your first time jumping in, try not to get on like a dickhead and try and, like, you know, you know, I mean, you know yourself, it's a different type of game. It's not like, you know, a traditional game. You, no one's going to play with you if you're a dickhead. You know what I mean? Be a good role player. Try not to matter game. That's all I can say. Um, like, if it's something you're really into, I think you're going to love it. And I'm happy for more people to get into it, the better. Because I know on Quest, they're forever looking for new players. Because there's just not enough players. Like, you know, because there's quite a few, like, you know um regiments and stuff and you need a lot of guardsmen you know what i mean you just need more players to be able to keep that up it just doesn't work otherwise uh but no back to the story at hand i thought that was a great send-off 
Um, I loved what they did. I really did feel like, you know, the actual epilogue at the end of Fallout, you know, the way you go it, I thought it was really good. I really, I, like, the light-up itself was great. Uh, and, like, you know, if you guys are still here listening to me right now, you know yourself, it was fucking outstanding. It was really good. And it pits a lot of actual, like, canon stories to shame, if I be honest with you. It's an amazing sandbox, great to play in, and uh, it's just sad more than anything that Fallout and Star Wars and, you know, there's plenty of other examples of beloved franchises that, you know, we all love and care for deeply that are just gone, you know, um, it's just went to shit. So, like, I think they live on in in spirit, I think, in these, like, you know, it's it's a weird mashup of little playing, fan fiction, light up. It's, it's really weird. It's really interesting. But, like, here, look, like, I'm, I'm keeping you boys long enough. Um, all I can say is if you really enjoyed it, like and subscribe, click the wee notification bell, and check out the Discord. Um, it's been going quite a bit since I mentioned it in the last video. So, like, you know, like, something to check out. And I hope you guys have enjoyed. If you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. This, this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumors growing on my back. And it's way down heavy on me and it's not okay. Can you help a nigga out and just stop this? Please?